I'm going to do that briefly because, as you know, we're limited in our time, and so we'll uh, try to stay with the format in which each of the speakers will have about 10 minutes to give their position, about two or three minutes to comment on each other, and then we'll get open the floor to your comments and questions. I'm briefly introducing all three of them at once, so I won't have to interrupt the flow of thought. Deborah Greenfield will be first. She's an Associate General Counsel for the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations. She specializes in regulatory issues affecting unions, not-for-profit law, and international labor issues, which is what we're doing today. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School and Swarthmore College. Not in that order. Adam Green will follow with a different perspective, the United States Council on International Business, where he is involved, responsible for the activities on labor policy. He proudly is not an attorney. He has a bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester and an MBA from NYU. Speaking of NYU, the third speaker will be Samuel S. Stryker, who's the Dwight D. Opperman Professor of Law at NYU. He's the director of the Center for, Center for Law and Employment there. He has his degree in industrial relations from Cornell and his JD from Columbia Law School, where he was EIC of the Columbia Law Review. Without further ado, we'll begin with Deborah, then Adam, then Sam. Thanks very much for the opportunity to participate in the discussion this morning. Um, and if people want to move forward, it's a small audience, and that might facilitate uh, discussion after our presentation, so feel free. Um, the title of the panel this morning, The Labor Movement, NGOs, International Labor Standards, and American Values, raises enormous issues, and issues that I think are also enormously important. Um, having said that, I also think that there's a certain amount of hype, so to speak, and maybe even a bit of panic about this issue right now, and a number of myths that should be debunked. For starters, the role of international labor standards in the global regime was just as pressing at several moments in recent history. When the ILO Constitution was drafted in 1919, when the U.S. made the decision to join the ILO in 1934, and when the ILO adopted the Declaration of Philadelphia, which stands as its charter in 1944. What seems to me to be different now, among other things, is that our increasingly globalized economy provides us with additional tools to address the challenges of human rights, and of course that includes labor rights, uh, within a larger context of income distribution and democracy. And free trade agreements simply provide us with one such tool. I don't think that anybody can argue credibly today that the mere fact of free trade is sufficient to lift the world out of poverty or to develop stable middle class and working class populations around the world. And let me just share two statistics that come from the United Nations in its 2007 Millennium Development Goals report. Um, first, the share of national consumption by the poorest fifth of the population in developing regions decreased between 1990 and 2004 from 4.6 to 3.9%. And in Eastern Asia, income inequality is actually widening considerably. And now let me add the following statistic to the mix. In the United States, the income gap in the, it has nearly doubled since 1980. And as labor practitioners and labor scholars, I think we should be very concerned about this. Um, apart from the legal arguments about American exceptionalism, which I know is the overarching theme of your conference, I think the fact that the United States income gap is widening, just like it is in the rest of the world, shows us that from a factual standpoint, what's happening in the, in the United States is not that exceptional. So this leads me to the specific question that the organizers of the panel posed to us today and that I'd like to address, and that is, will the ratcheting effect of ILO standards expansion and related NGO efforts effectively undermine American sovereignty and federalism and our labor law's core values? And I'll start by saying that the question to me has a whiff of when did you start beating your wife? Having said that, I think the answer to the question is really a resounding no. And perhaps the most important point I want to make today is that international labor standards are those that the world community, and that includes the United States, has articulated over time. 
We embraced those standards when we joined the ILO in 1934. We reaffirmed them in 1944 by being among the countries adopting the Declaration of Philadelphia. And once again, we renewed our commitment to them in 1998 when we voted to adopt at the ILO the Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, which I'll touch on and I'm sure Adam will also. So the notion that international labor standards are somehow external and could therefore pose a threat to national sovereignty makes no sense to me, and I think it's fair to say makes no sense to the labor movement in, uh, on a global scale. Having said that, I want to answer the panel's question in three parts. First, there's no expansion of ILO standards taking place today. I think what we're witnessing is an attempt to use free trade agreements as another vehicle to prevent countries from gaining an advantage by ignoring minimal labor standards that the entire world, including the United States, has agreed on. Second, those efforts don't undermine American sovereignty and federalism. And third, if you take international labor standards seriously, then you inevitably confront some of the deep contradictions within American labor law and practice. From my perspective within the labor movement, that's an important confrontation that ought to take place, and it ought to guide us in evaluating the adequacies and inadequacies of American law and practice. With respect to my uh, first premise, that there's no expansion of ILO standards going on today, I want to talk about the 1998 Declaration. That declaration, as one commentator has stated, is a succinct restatement of the four core labor rights, freedom of association, which includes collective bargaining, the elimination of forced labor, the abolition of child labor, and non-discrimination in employment that are protected in the eight fundamental ILO conventions. And I can't emphasize enough the fact that the declaration that was passed at the ILO in 1998 is the product of tripartite consensus, as is everything at the ILO. Governments, employers, and workers, including those from the United States, were part of that consensus. It's our declaration, just as much as it belongs to any other nation. So on the one hand, the declaration imposes no additional substantive obligations on sovereign nations, the United States or, or any other nation. On the other hand, the declaration does, I think, mark a singular moment in history because the world community came together and made some choices, some important choices about competing labor rights to arrive at the four fundamental rights. Notice, for example, that there's nothing about safety and health in the four fundamental rights. There's nothing about minimum wage, there's nothing about working hours, and there's nothing about any form of social protection, including health care or retirement security. So I think that this belies any claim that what core labor standards are designed to do is impose developed world standards on developing countries and deny them their ability to use the so-called competitive adva comparative advantage um, in order to uh, develop, uh, to, to participate in the global trading regime. I think it also belies the claim that what international labor standards, fundamental labor standards are designed to do is to impose universal social protections on developed free market economies such as ours. Now, not surprisingly, there's been an enormous debate from the very beginning about what it means to respect, promote, and realize the principles underlying these four core rights. And in fact, the debate has centered on whether these principles have any meaning at all, whether they even impose any meaningful commitments. Our position in the labor movement is that they do have meaning and they do impose commitments. And that's probably easiest to see with respect to what it means to respect uh, the principles of freedom and association. Because here we have the benefit of close to 3,000 cases considered by the ILO's Committee on Freedom of Association over the last 50 years. And I know that Adam is going to touch on the committee a little bit in his presentation. We also have the benefit of the comments each year by the Declaration's expert advisors on whether countries are living up to these commitments. Now, because the AFL-CIO and our affiliates believe that the Declaration imposes meaningful obligations, our efforts over the past decade or so have been to find the appropriate vehicles for enforcing these commitments. And free trade agreements provide one such vehicle. That's all it is. It's one vehicle for getting countries in a reciprocal bilateral or multilateral relationship to abide by the world's labor standards. 
and it makes the logical link between reciprocal trade benefits and the maintenance of minimal labor standards. I think it's, it's completely logical to impose labor standards on the receipt of trade benefits, whether it's from the United States or from another country. So let me move to my second point. What does it mean in practice to incorporate these labor standards as articulated in the Declaration into a free trade agreement? As I said, I don't think this represents any encroachment on American sovereignty. And I want to use the Peru free trade agreement as an example for two reasons. One, as you know, it just passed the House and is moving on to the Senate. And two, it represents the strongest formulation of a commitment to abide by core labor rights in a free trade agreement that we have so far. Now, the Peru FTA labor chapter does two things. It says that each party must adopt and maintain in its statutes and regulations and practices thereunder the rights set forth in the Declaration, and it prohibits a party from failing to effectively enforce its labor laws, including those that effectuate the Declaration rights, through a sustained or recurring course of action or inaction, and here I think is the important part, in a manner affecting trade or investment between the parties. So what would a claim by Peru against the United States look like under the Peru Free Trade Agreement? Peru would have to claim that we had failed somehow to enforce our own labor laws in a, a way um, including those provisions that protect the core rights set forth in the Declaration in a manner that affects trade between the parties. And what are the consequences? The dispute would go to the uh, dispute go through the dispute resolution mechanism set forth in the free trade agreement. That includes an arbitration panel that would be convened and there would be a decision. What are the sanctions? Is it changing American labor law? No. It's either suspending trade benefits or imposing monetary compensation. So there's no hint whatsoever that we would be forced to change our labor laws. And I also want to raise, I think, a question that no one has ever really been able to answer satisfactorily, to me at least, and that is why is it that the labor commitments in free trade agreements are any different from the commitments we make with respect to, for example, intellectual property rights in the same free trade agreements. In the Singapore free trade agreement, for example, to take one such agreement, we committed to ratifying or acceding to no less than five treaties and conventions respecting intellectual property rights. The USTR touts the Peru free trade agreements provisions as being consistent with, quote, emerging international standards. So what is it about labor rights that makes us balk at adhering to international instruments? You tell us pretty quickly. Okay, I would submit that it's because it implicates issues of distributive justice, and I would leave it at that. Finally, one, uh, just a few words about whether ILO standards undermine American labor values. I think in large measure, the National Labor Relations Act embodies the same principles that core labor standards do. And I think if you look at the preamble to the NLRA, that's apparent. On the other hand, to quote Ted St. Antoine, one of our most noted labor scholars, um, who said over 20 years ago, the intensity of opposition to unionization, which is exhibited by American employers, has no parallel in the Western industrialized world. And I would just leave you with this thought, that what international labor standards allow us to do is to expose that deep contradiction within American law and practice. That is, that our basic laws do in most respects, although there are certain glaring exceptions, conform to international labor standards. But in practice, we have gone far, far away from the promise of the NLRA. And what international labor standards allow us to do is to examine our own law and practice using the guideposts of standards set by the world community. And that, I think, is a very important exercise. Thank you. Thank you. Adam? Thanks. I'm actually going to sit from here because I've got notes on three different pieces of paper, and I've just recently had to wear, start wearing glasses, and I'm not sure I'm going to manage all of this at once. Um, as was said, I'm not an attorney. I just want to make that clear. I'm also not an expert in domestic labor law, so I want to make that clear in case as we get into questions. My, our fo my focus is on the ILO. Um, and just as very briefly on the U.S. Council for International Business, it's a membership organization based in New York, works solely on international business across a range of functional areas, including the ILO. Um, and if you're not familiar with the ILO at all, just to briefly mention, it's a tripartite organization, which means it's made up of governments that have 50% of the voting power, 
Trade unions have 25% of the voting power and employers have 25%. So we are, in terms of the ILO standards and the governance, um, the AFL and the USCIB are at the table along with the governments. So we're, we're all party to everything that's going on, although the, the balance of power uh, is clearly not completely equal. Um, I'm going to touch on, uh, very as in the time I have, uh, the ratification of ILO standards in the U.S., the trade debate that's been, that's been going on and the link to the kind of the ratification, and some areas where we think the ILO could actually be very effective in current, uh, current day issues, namely uh, supply chain, uh, but those are not legal issues per se, but I'm just going to touch on that. Um, and then some areas of labor law reform that the ILO uh, does and, and could do. Um, as background, as I say, there is an organization called the International Organization of Employers, which represents employers in the ILO, um, and we participate in the ILO through that group. We're also party to some domestic uh, structures, namely the President's Committee on the ILO and a legal subcommittee uh, called uh, TAPLES, the um, Tripartite Advisory Panel on International Labor Standards, which reviews uh, conventions for consideration in the U.S. As background, the ILO has adopted 187 conventions since its founding in 1919. Of these, eight have been, as, as Barbara, meant, as Deborah mentioned, uh, eight have been signified as core labor standards, and she went down that list. So those are the those are the conventions that we, we're going to focus on, and I think most people do focus on um, when talking about these issues. In addition, the ILO has a number of supervisory mechanisms. They're review bodies that, that review compliance, ratification rates, and, and Im implementation of conventions in the countries that ratify them. One is the Committee on, of Experts. Another is the Conference Committee on the Application of Standards. And they routinely put out reports on, on what countries have done uh, that have ratified. And many of these say things like, uh, country X has taken no steps to implement a convention in the last 40 years since it ratified the convention. So a, a, a key tenet of our perspective of ILO conventions is that ratification is not all it's cracked up to be. Um, and the ILO focus on ratification rates over actual implementation and enforcement is, is completely skewed. Um, they measure They measure progress based on ratification even where in many cases absolutely nothing happens versus the context in the U.S., which is frankly the exact opposite. The U.S. ratifies very little. We're up there with Somalia and Sudan in terms of the, the number of uh, conventions that we've ratified. But we have implementation and we have enforcement that a lot of countries that have ratified, many of them, uh, simply ignore. So there's a, there's a perspective that I think we bring from the U.S. that is dramatically different from the rest of the world where our legal structure um, demands implementation enforcement, uh, and, and that does set us apart. The third mechanism is the uh, Committee on Freedom of Association, uh, which was mentioned, and that is, is, is even described in our, in, in the employers group, as one of the crown jewels of the ILO. It is, it is a, an effective organization, uh, instrument, and it's looking solely at freedom of association, primarily because it's freedom of association for both em workers and employers. And uh, one of the reasons we support it, if you look last week, the ILO put out a, uh, a, dec a resolution on Venezuela, really chiding Venezuela for the actions it's taken against employer groups in Venezuela, uh, limiting their freedom and the, and the work that they do. So it's not simply a one-sided uh, story. <coughs> However, there's a, there's a conflict um, that arises, as uh, Deborah mentioned, because the Committee on Freedom of Association, in many ways, uh, will judge a country against the conventions that it has not ratified. And that's where the U.S. comes into, um, comes into play in many cases. It will, it will look at an issue of freedom of association and measure the country against the convention, regardless of ratification. And obviously, in the U.S., we have not ratified the treaty. There are technical provisions that we do not com uh, conform with. Uh, and, and we end up in this limbo of being held to a standard that we have expressly not accepted as, as national law. And the, 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 the way the, uh, the, the instrument the ILO developed to address that potential conflict was the declaration. 
the 1998 Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work that Deborah referenced. It was, it was the, the other side of the coin to the WTO debate on trade and labor at the time. It was developed with express backing by the U.S. Council for International Business and the AFL. Um, there are players on both sides that made that happen. Normally, there are lots of people who like to claim uh, support for something that worked. But in this case, I think the AFL and, and USCIB were, did, were instrumental in, in making that happen. And it's a political statement. And this is where, this is where the distinction uh, needs to be emphasized and where a lot of the confusion comes from. The declaration is a political statement. And it does ask for um, countries, any member of the ILO, to respect and promote the principles. But it does not relate to the conventions themselves. And this is a, is a piece where even within the ILO it gets um, blurred because in many cases the, the follow-up mechanism that is used to review how countries respect and promote the declaration, again, judges countries against the conventions and not, not something else. So they are looking at technical aspects of the conventions. So even there we end up in a potential conflict where the, the, the actual implementation of the, of the, or respecting the declaration is equated with implementing the conventions. The declaration also says, at, in, at the insistence of developing countries, that labor standards should not be used for protectionist trade purposes. It was, it, it was a constant worry, and mainly in developing countries, that labor standards will be used uh, in, as a protectionist measure. Uh, and that is something that they continue to, uh, to focus on um, very strongly. In terms of U.S. obligations, obviously, um, we have to, as it says, we have to respect, promote, and realize the principles in the Declaration. Of the, of the eight conventions that relate to these principles, we've ratified two. So the U.S. is bound to, bound to comply with the two we've ratified. One is pending in the Senate, as has, has been mentioned. The other five uh, are, are not, have not been ratified, and there's no plan to put them to the Senate. Um, for many reasons, um, but primarily they've been found to conflict with U.S. law and practice. Three have been, three have gone through the legal review uh, that I described, where a tripartite legal review, including workers, employers, and the government, and found to be in conflict. And two have simply never been submitted to the legal review because they, they, can, they so clearly conflict um, with many different aspects of uh, longstanding uh, labor law. In terms of um, the, the process, I'll touch on briefly because uh, it, was, it was described, there are three conditions by which a convention, uh, th that a convention needs to meet before it can be submitted for um, uh, Senate consent. That each ILO convention will be examined on its merits on a tri tripartite basis, so all three parties at the table. That if there are any differences between the convention and federal law and practice, these will be dealt with in the normal legislative process, meaning that, that we'll, those will be any changes that are required and, and deemed necessary jointly will be dealt with through domestic legislative processes, state and federal, and that there's no intention to change state law and practice by federal action through the ratification of an ILO standard. So any changes would need to be put in place first, and then a standard would be submitted. And that's an agreement that is essentially still in effect from 1980 when the uh, U.S. came back into the ILO, an agreement supported by uh, the government, the uh, AFL, and the USCIB, um, and again, implemented through the legal subcommittee of the President's Committee on the ILO. In terms of uh, one point, just briefly on, on the question that was raised in terms of evolving standards. Um, the only area where there is an evolving nature to ILO standards is in the, in the um, committee of experts that reviews application of ILO conventions. And in their review of what countries have done, they do look at newer ILO standards, more recent ILO standards, to measure the degree to which a country is applying one of the freedom, one of the core conventions. So there's an element to which, uh, for the conventions passed 
in uh, conventions 87 and 98 on freedom of association and collective bargaining, the committee will look at more recent conventions to inform their review. So in that sense, there is something, it's, it's, it's fairly limited, but there is something to say that, that conventions passed later will affect the, uh, the obligations that you may or may not face under the convention. Thank you, Adam. It'd be Sam's turn All right. now. Okay. Thank you. By the way, I'm glad Adam's not a lawyer because um, we as lawyers need non-lawyers and we have a symbiotic relationship with them and without them, we don't exist. But I can see that I've, I've lost my audience already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have a little bit of a muffled voice here because I, I, I didn't understand the theme of this uh, uh, segment because I don't see at this point a threat to U.S. federalism. Um, and if there were any threat to it, I'd be very concerned, but I don't, I don't see it at this point. Things can happen down the road, and it's, and it's hard to say how this Peru model is going to evolve, but, but at this point, I don't, I don't see any. I agree with uh, Deborah on this. I'm also qualifiedly in endorsing uh, the labor rights <coughs> approach. I mean, I think this, there's merit to it uh, to some extent. Um, and I think, actually, we've dropped the ball on China, which uh, I don't know why there's all this sturm and drang over Mexico and Peru and Brazil, because as far as I can tell from talking to my clients, I'm both an academic and a practitioner, all of our manufacturing capabilities gone to China. And um, China doesn't have an independent labor mo movement, uh, notwithstanding the efforts of Andy Stern and others to help out the, uh, the communist-dominated labor federation. Uh, there is one labor federation uh, in China, and it's a very close uh, kissing cousin of the local bureaucracy, and, uh, and that's the labor movement. So they've just drafted this uh, employment contract law. It looks pretty good, but uh, no one really knows how that would be enforced. So I think China is actually a place where we, we uh, uh, in the United States, should be uh, interested in, in labor rights because it is a form. I take a very contrarian view here. I think trade is great for the developing world, and the data supports that. Uh, it is where the uh, U.S. multinationals are, that where the, uh, the highest wages are being paid, even in China. It's in the coastal regions where that trade is going on. Uh, there, all the evidence su uh, suggests that the um, direct uh, investment is going into places that are, that are pretty good on labor rights, not bad on labor rights. And if you're a, a country that gets stuck in one of these terrible places, you want to get out of it. I just got, I was involved in writing a brief in the Second Circuit in a litigation involving Talisman Energy, which is a big construction outfit, uh, one of their, their predecessor companies got involved in the Sudan. The first thing they did when they bought the company is get out of the Sudan. They still have legacy alien tort act litigation, but what I'm saying is there's a tendency out there to think that this is for them. It's not for them. It's for us. Do we, is there a public interest in maintaining a, a somewhat healthy manufacturing sector? I happen to think there is. I fear if the, we have a conventional war down the road that we'll have to beg the Chinese uh, to tell us how to build warships. I mean, that bothers me. That's a national security interest. I also think we should be interested in whether or not we can employ people who are not going to be part of the knowledge economy. Can we employ them in decent jobs? So here I also share some concerns with, with the AFL-CIO. I just wish they'd be more honest about what is, what is driving them because I do think this is a big concern. <coughs> we had subcontracted out our entire manufacturing capability to China, and they are competing against us under terms that we would not allow even in Mississippi or, the, or any of the other states of the Union. And the, with a dominated labor force uh, that cannot move from, from the, uh, province to province, that cannot bargain freely, where the, uh, the price that is uh, attached to limb and life is, is low, I mean, these are all things that we ought to be concerned about, and there's nothing wrong with saying we care about it for us, because at the end of the day, I believe that is the true source of charity. We care about it, and therefore we're going to do something about it. Now, on the other side, to show you that I'm a contrarian, I'm a, I am concerned about the evolving labor rights movement, and I want to say a few words about it. I have no problem with the ILO declaration, the basic notion that it be a free and independent labor movement, that's very important. Uh, with the notion that if, that, uh, you, if you have a child labor law, you enforce it, that you don't discriminate against people on the basis of race and religion and gender. That's how what I understand the ILO declaration to be. I am tr troubled, however, by, th this is a movement afoot, it hasn't really fully happened yet, but using 
uh, these norms as a predicate for litigation and for you know, chastisement of the United States and that sort of thing. Uh, one uh, is the point that Adam made about ratification rate. In the United States, when we sign a treaty, it's taken seriously. In lots of these countries, it's not. It's extremely difficult to enforce these treaties. They generally operate under the assumption of non-self-execution, which means it takes an act of parliament to make them the domestic law of the particular state. Our assumption here in the United States is the treaties are self-executing. They're part of the supreme law covered by the supremacy clause. Another problem is concepts. I went to law school because I'm a materialist. I'm in labor law because I care about real life things, but there are, there's a whole strand of folks out there in law, in European and, and other circles that believe in norms, that norms have a life of their own. So you take a norm like freedom of association, they pour the content they want to into that norm. But there's nothing inherent in freedom of association that answers the following questions. Do you have a right to strike if you're a government worker? Do you have a right to strike and not have temporary workers or permanent workers hired as substitutes for the strike? Do you have a right to strike and management allowed to perform bargaining at work? Do you have a right to exclusive collective bargaining as opposed to members only collective bargaining? Do you have a right to have the state extend the collective agreement to the non-organized sector? These are all important features of other laws and are they inherent in, in freedom of association? If you read uh, the reports of the, uh, the committee, so-called committee of experts, uh, I call it so-called committee of experts because I don't believe they're experts, um, but you know, they, they read into freedom of association their desired content and there's nothing inherent in the concept. These are all problematic choices that are made by different uh, countries and they have different uh, things behind it. Second problem, that's the fluidity of concepts. That uh, you know, they stand alone, they don't have a life of their own, they get framed in light of institutions, they get framed in light of the legal culture, they get framed in light of the mode of enforcement. Second point, incomplete comparativism. Comparative law has got to be the most intellectually shoddy area that is out there, and I'll tell you why. One is most of us are not fluent in other languages, not even French or German. Uh, and even if we are fluent, our ability to read the, the legal literature in, this, in these languages is limited. We certainly don't know Mandarin, Russian, and, and a bunch of other. Uh. Secondly, the people who are academics who write about these systems have no interest in giving you the institutional detail. So for example, you could read a 300 page book on German labor law and not know that works councils don't have the right to strike. They don't have the right to strike. And that's because there's no interest in the European civil law tradition in giving you a practical understanding of what the legal system's like. They're all about norm elaboration, norm elucidation, norm interchange. That is the civil law tradition. That is where the academic work is gonna look like. Why is this important? Well, you know that we are uh, exceptional in the United States in being employment at will. And, and the other countries are all uh, unjust dismissal jurisdictions. I guarantee you, and I've made this offer to Cliff Pilevsky and other plaintiff representatives, if they wanna go to the European model, I will work day and night to help them get there. Why? Because the European model does have just cause, but it does not have litigation. It does not have punitive damages. It does not have jury trials. It does not have a mental uh, pain and suffering relief. It does not have attorney's fees. It does not have class actions. They're administrative remedies, and they are by and large capped recoveries. There's some multiple of back pay. In fact, you look at the British statistics, where I think this is gonna be best, you would be astounded at what median recoveries are in the unjust dismissal regime. If plaintiffs want to go there, if the AFL-CIO wants to go there, I swear to you, I'm, I'm certain I can even convince John Radabout into this, we will go with you to the British model. I suggested this to Cliff Polevsky of uh, Oakland, California, who's an advisor on my restatement of employment law project. He says, I, you misunderstand, Sam. I do not want the British model. I want the California model. <laughs> and I think he's being, he's being honest there. Now, I don't think Adam got to this, but you know, the ILO has been advising Cambodia about labor rights. They apparently have a thousand units or a thousand unions or 1,500 unions? 1,300 unions. 1,300 unions. Now, you know why? Because they have plural unionism in Europe. That means anyone can form a union. Why can anyone form a union? Because it doesn't mean anything. Did you know that in France, for example, there are five union federations, the communists, they still have a communist trade union movement in France, socialist trade union movement, Catholic trade union movement, and a bunch of other, two others, and they, everyone can form their own unit. It doesn't mean anything because the employer decides which contract he's gonna pick. Did you know that? 
It doesn't mean anything in Germany because they're so well organized, they only have one union for every five industries. You have a right to form your own union, but they've got no role in the multi-employer collective bargaining. You go to the Ministry of Labor, if there's some persnickety employer out there who doesn't want to organize, doesn't want to be part of the collective bargaining agreement, doesn't want to be part of the multi-employer association, you go to the Labor Ministry and say, extend the contract. That's what they do. They extend the contract. It's a different system. So this is what I call incomplete comparativism. Misleading absolutism, third flaw. Yes, we have freedom of association, but what does that speak to about government workers? I mean, is it desirable, in my view, that the French government workers who have better pensions than the private sector workers can go out on strike with impunity? Is that the way to run a society? Well, if you're a French government worker, yes, it is. It is the way to run a society. Why, why aren't they even trying to maintain operations? I mean, don't put people in jail. There is that right to strike. Fine, give them a right to strike, but try to maintain operations. I'm certain that politicians will be killed in kneecaps uh, if they were to do that in France. But I don't, don't understand why quickly. that's inherent in freedom of association, the risk-free strike. Right? Kill them pretty quickly. So. Okay. Final point on uh, linkage models. We have to use the trade agreements for some linkage here. Uh, the NAFTA models will work pretty well, I think. That's the Polonius model, to thine own self be true. You have labor laws, enforce them. Even China has terrific labor laws. I don't think we have to invent anything. Let's go there and cause a clamor for their enforcement cause a clamor for independent unionism because they're unwilling to acknowledge publicly that they, they have one labor union, it's a transmitter of state directives. Uh, the Peru model is new. I, if it means the damaged lawsuits and litigation and uh, uh, alien tort act litigation, I'm against it. If, it. if it means hand wringing, I'm for it because I believe that people should have uh, an escape valve uh, for their emotions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next round, each of the panelists is going to have two or three minutes to comment on the other presentations, and then we'll begin Q&A. Now, I've been told that we should quit a little earlier than is scheduled. We're going to be quitting by 1040, because McConnell's speech will begin at 1045 in the Grand Ballroom. So we'll quit five minutes early. Uh, before that, we'll hear from uh, Deborah Greenfield again. Thanks. Um, I wanted to make one point, I guess, in, uh, in response to what Adam said about the Declaration, that the Declaration uh, doesn't uh, require us to um, abide by conventions, that the Declaration is a political statement. The Declaration is not a political statement. I agree that the Declaration is different than the conventions, and that's an important distinction because we don't, if you haven't ratified a convention, then you are not bound by the convention. However, the principles that the Declaration articulates are those that come directly from the founding instruments of the ILO, from its constitution, from the Declaration of Philadelphia. And those are the principles that are embodied in the conventions. So when you look to, to flesh out what it means to abide by a principle in the Declaration, I think you run right into what the Committee on Freedom of Association has said are the principles of freedom of association. The Committee on Freedom of Association, and I think this goes to something that, um, that Sam said, which is that there are no inherent um, uh, standards in conventions. That may be, uh, to me, that, that's a statement that doesn't have much meaning because the world community on a tripartite basis has over the last 50 years articulated what it means to abide by principles of freedom of association. That is what the Committee on Freedom of Association does on a tripartite basis. So for example, why do we know that, um, d that uh, not including agricultural workers or domestic workers or, or public servants uh, within the definition of employees under the NLRA is a violation of freedom of association? It's because the Committee on Freedom of Association has, has articulated that time and time again. It doesn't matter whether we've ratified the Convention on Freedom of Association. It's a principle underlying the conventions, and it's a principle that we, as a member of the ILO, agreed to when we joined the ILO. And so I think that there's way too much emphasis placed on the distinction between the Declaration and the Convention. Second, and um, I'll just say, 
a word about self-executing versus non-self-executing treaties. I think we could spend weeks, months, years talking about self-executing versus non-self-executing. And I don't think we should assume that the reason the United States doesn't ratify um, uh, conventions with respect to labor rights is that because we think once we do, it will have an immediate effect on United States law. That's a way too sim simple and simplistic an analysis of the effect of an, uh, of an ILO convention on domestic law. Adam. Um, um, thanks. Just very quickly, I think we're, we're just going to have a different view on the on the declaration because in our in the way it was developed and, and constructed, it was at least in our view, it is a political statement as a declaration. It's not legally binding, um, so it's not written as as something that can be binding, and it and in our view should not be and can't be equated with the conventions themselves uh, because in many ways we we can respect the principles. The whole point behind the declaration was that you could get out of this mire of, of the technical details of the conventions versus upholding the principles of freedom of association and the others um, that we can all get behind. And you can hold out against countries like China that are members of the ILO and hold them to t take them to task and ask in terms of respecting those kinds of, of rights. Um, in terms of the, uh, the impact on trade, uh, and, and Deborah had said it correctly in terms of the two areas. One is up in, in the new and the deal that was struck that hasn't quite been implemented yet. Um, in terms, in our view, linking it to the declaration is is fine and right. It's fine. The declaration is, as we say, it's a it's a political statement. It upholds those rights. Um, it is not the conventions. If if there was a link to to upholding or abiding by the conventions themselves, obviously the whole thing falls apart because we are we can, we are out of compliance with at least five of them. Um, the the in our view, the more important and more the other piece that has more of an impact is is still the piece that was always there, which is effective enforcement. It started with NAFTA and has been in every in the labor provision in every trade agreement since. It holds the parties to the effective enforcement of their own national law. Because in our view, the big problem in the world today, and this is where it gets into the supply chain de debate, is the national standards, even in China and many countries, is fine. Labor law, as written, is fine. It's just that actual practice is down here somewhere. And, it, and it's be a result because of the huge percentage of the informal economy in a lot of these countries. These people are simply not in the system. Um, <coughs> in many respects, they have rights uh, in law that are beyond the capacity of about 95% of the, of the enterprises to deliver. The best maternity leave you can find in the world is in Eritrea. Uh, you have countries that have three year severance pays, mandatory, um, that, that nobody gets, and just simply nobody gets because it's, nobody <coughs> took it seriously. So one, one issue for that we think these trade agreements and provisions help is to close that gap. We also think the ILO should be doing a whole lot more on that. As related to that, though, as a final point, you can't insist on a culture of compliance, which is something we as a country do. Uh, we insist on a culture of compliance here. We, we insist on it in other countries. If the legal standard is completely out of whack with the status and development of the country, and that's what's happened over the years, many countries have instituted labor law that is beyond their capacity to, to deliver and implement. And so there will have to be reforms in countries like Eritrea to reduce, I think it was multiple year maternity leave, full pay or paid in a half, down to something that they can actually provide. Okay, thank you. Adam, Sam? Um, I'm just uh, uh, a little bit surprised that uh, Deborah takes the view that freedom of association is what this committee says it is. Uh, and I think that Samuel Gompers would have been very surprised. Now, I don't think it's a legal basis for that assertion. Yes, that's a committee that says what freedom of association is, but it doesn't spell out the content of our commitment under the ILO declaration. If it does, Adam, you've done a very bad job, and in, in you and Ed Potter before you uh, in negotiating that. You know, th this is really a substitute for domestic political issues. You know, you try to win the hearts and minds of the American people, and if that doesn't work, you win the hearts and minds of your friends in Geneva. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's being used for that purpose. I really read, if you read the submissions of the AFL, to the ILO, uh, and you know, maybe it'll get some people to agree with them there, but I just don't think this has anything to do with the legal text that were agreed to by the United States. Okay, we're gonna begin the question and answers. I have been uncharacteristically quiet so far 
While you're getting your questions in order, I'm going to turn to Deborah with something that's a digression, but it's a digression she started with. That is, you seem to assume that an increasing income gap is a bad thing. I suggest if you think of the model of two guys in Seattle starting a software company in their garage and making several million dollars the second year, they automatically have increased the income gap between them and anybody working for them. Now, over the next few years, they can double the pay of the people working for them, but they're tripling their own, and the income gap is increasing, but everybody's better off. This is an expansionist time, even though a little slower than it was the last two quarters. Why is not an increasing income gap at best a good sign of an expanding world economy and at worst a neutral sign of the inevitability of the laws of large numbers? The increasing income gap, in my view, is not a sign of, of wide shared prosperity. It may mean that some people are making more money but if the share of consumption goes down among the poorest, and if their share of the income that the world is creating is going down, and that's what the statistics show, then what we're doing is, yes, we may be creating more income, but only for some people. I'm I don't understand the logic of that at all. If everybody is going up, but that's not if the everybody case. is, whoa, 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 whoa. it up. may or may not be the case. But, but whether there's a debating. larger income gap is not a pr an evidence that there is a decrease in the absolute in absolute terms in the uh, capacity of the bottom consumer. When you're comparing it to an increase at the top, all that shows is the rate of relative increase. It has nothing to do with whether there is in fact an increase in poverty. It is at worst neutral. It is not logically any sign at all that there's a decrease in their absol in absolute terms. Their share of a larger pie may be a smaller percent and still be a larger piece of pie. It's at worst neutral. We'll have to look at the statistics in question. It depends on whether it's accurate. I think you agree with that, Deborah. Don't you? It isn't, it isn't the differential alone that's troubling you. Right. It's yeah, the, it's all I'm saying is the differential is at worst a neutral quality. It is not a sign of anything getting worse. No, I, I, I guess I can't agree with that if, in fact, the differential Mathematically, increases. you can't refute it. If the differential but is greater, but in absolute terms, the pie being cut up is also greater, you have not established anything when you say that the percentage share received by the less consumer is smaller than it was as a percent of a smaller pie. But what the statistics are showing is that the people at the bottom are not, their income level is not rising enough to get them out of poverty. The there UN may be some other statistic that shows yes. that, but that one doesn't. Well, cost of living. Yeah, cost of living as compared to that might show it, but the income gap is at worst a neutral quality. I've taken up more time than I should as a moderator, but I'll tend to be an exacerbator rather than a moderator. Well, so. I'll, just, I'll just say this. The UN Millennium Development Goals seek to have at least half the world um, earning, uh, living on at, at least a dollar a day. That's the world poverty level by 2012, I believe it is, or 2015. And that goal is not being realized. As trade is generated, as we create more, more reciprocity between countries, we are not realizing that goal in some of the de most deeply impoverished places in the world. And I think that shows that trade alone doesn't distribute the benefits of income generation uh, on, on its own. You need something more than that. The dollar a day index may well show that, but that's an independent variable on the size of the income gap. Okay, nobody is standing at the microphones. If you want to ask a question, go to the microphone. I won't call on you till you get there. Okay. It's supposed to be, and I hear you, and I don't hear very well, so yeah. prompt me on if I can hear you. There's help coming. The only group that gets discriminated against in this country without redress are the short people. Exactly. But yeah, I, if I'm Sam stands up, you'll see that he is a, 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 a empathetic and not sympathetic. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not complaining. I'm true to my principles. Uh, professor, you mentioned uh, the Alien Tort Act. Yes. And I think that even though it wasn't on the topic, right. I think it's a really good illustration of how people who cannot win the domestic argument over how American companies or multinational companies ought to act with labor abroad are turning to the U.S. courts to try to force um, change, social and uh, labor change. Could you comment on that phenomenon and how it can be halted? Well, the Alien Tort Act is very uh, troubling for me. Um, we are making international law in the Ninth Circuit, which is not recognized anywhere else in the world. Uh, so, for example, there's corporate liability under the Alien Tort Act, even though the Rome Statute that sets up the ICC specifically excludes corporate liability because, and I'm paraphrasing, there, has not, there is not a worldwide community of, of that a consensus around the concept of corporate liability. The Ninth Circuit uses a, uh, a, a definition of aiding and abetting liability, also not recognized anywhere else in the world except for uh, the appellate judges on the International Criminal Court for the former uh, uh, Rwanda and Yugoslavia, who seem to have nothing else to do with their time, but take common law crimes like rape and turn them into genocide crimes. And they write these 100-page opinions with 150 paragraphs, and then you know, Ninth Circuit has picked up on that. I'm very troubled by this statute. And um, uh, you know, so you take a case like uh, the one in the Second Circuit still pending, which involved this Canadian company, Talisman Energy. I think I mentioned it earlier in my remarks. You know, they built a couple of airfields for the, uh, for the government in the Sudan, at least their predecessor did, without any specific intent of furthering any heinous activity. Uh, Sudan was not listed by the State Department at that time as a country that, or by the Canadian counterpart as a country you couldn't do business with. And now they've got this ongoing uh, litigation involving, you know, tens and tens of lawyers all over the world. I think it's troubling. I mean, that is, you know, we have this judicialized system. It's not just the self-execution of treaties. We have a user-friendly legal system, a tortified legal system, that is the envy of plaintiff lawyers all over the world. You, there are all these, I call this the chocolate chip cookie concept. We may not have the greatest normative law in the world. We have a lot of grain in our cookie that's not very interesting, but we have a hell of a lot of good exceptions, and they are rich, deep chocolate, and when you bite in the cookie, your teeth get stuck. Whereas in other countries, they have this fantastic chocolate around all their cookies, but no one gets anywhere near the cookie because you cannot bring these lawsuits. You have to get the trade union to uh, fund the lawsuit. It's almost impossible. It's a major risk to bring a lawsuit if you lose you bankrupt yourself. Next question. I, just while they're coming to the mic, I'd only add it's it's a, also a function of a, a long-standing trend to to go after companies because it's harder or much more difficult, impossible, to go after the government that that is responsible for the act. They're the immune. Response. They're yeah. actually immune from suit. And it as and and uh, as it relates to the topic of labor standards, that's exactly what's happening at the whole supply chain debate. Uh, forgive my ignorance. Uh, as an example, uh, within the eight core uh, labor standards, if I have this right, there is, is there an international Title VII? And if so, if I'm right, how could that not affect American sovereignty? There is no, um, there is no, there isn't a core convention on non-discrimination. Um, is it as detailed as Title VII? No. Um, and so when you say, how does it affect American sovereignty, if we haven't ratified the convention, as we've all said, it is not American law. We have lots of checks and balances before we ratify a convention so that we only ratify conventions that don't have a conflict with domestic law. So again, we have a, a, a whole system of, um, to ensure that the convention is not going to preempt, supersede, choose your word, domestic law. Nonetheless, the convention sets out certain minimal standards of non-discrimination, and we are therefore entitled to, um, at the ILO, get an opinion about whether or not an American practice does or doesn't conform to the world community's view about what minimal 
non-discrimination in employment standards are. I don't see that that's an affront to American sovereignty. We're not called upon to change our laws as a member of the ILO. If you, going back to your point about the Declaration, then, if the Declaration has language saying, for example, the pursuit of happiness, and that's not, that hasn't been executed by a body, a state law, or a, a statute otherwise, can, can somebody go and sue on the principle of the pursuit to happiness under? No, no. So let's take a real example instead of something like the pursuit of happiness. Let's take um, uh, the exclusion of agricultural <coughs> workers from the, the, the National Labor Relations Act, right? They are, they are not entitled to the protections of the act. They're not defined within the scope of employee. We know that that violates principles of freedom of association at the ILO. We know that because the Committee of Freedom Association has said that over and over again, okay? Does that mean that an agricultural worker, an organization that represents agricultural workers could sue, um, sue whom? Sue the government? No, it doesn't. It absolutely does not mean that. What it means is when we look at the adequacy of domestic labor law and we want to see what's what's right and what's wrong and we want a yardstick a measurement we have the world body again government employers and workers participating in all of the decision making by consensus we have those yardsticks where there is uh, one more uh, uh, yeah let's get, it's getting to be somebody else's turn now i think john Two questions, one for you and one for Sam and Adam. Uh, the, on this issue of associational rights, uh, yes or no, uh, candidate Greenfield, <laughs> it, it, is it not true that uh, the union's position in arguing that the Convention on Associational Rights is, is critical, isn't that just a complete rehash of the debate that led to the Taft-Hartley and what we've heard forever for all of us in the room through every undergraduate and graduate course forever by professors arguing that uh, uh, we should have collective bargaining, it necessitates a representative of the employees, therefore the U.S. law supports unionization. When in fact the Taft-Hartley Act says by choice of the human being, the fellow citizen, the worker, Aren't you, isn't this just another way to rehash that same argument again? No. Interesting. I disagree. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, follow so up. So you knew the answer to that question, John? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I'm not sure why then you, you tried to insult the National Labor Relations Board by filing a mock complaint with, a, with the ILO when you know this country hasn't affirmed that, uh, that confederation. What, what's the point in that? The point is that over the course of the last several years, in our view, the decisions of the board deviate significantly from not only what we considered the law to be, and they've, they've reversed precedent, they've reached out to is for issues that they didn't have to decide, that, and, and their decisions are not in conformity with the world community's view of what employers rights are and what employees' rights are. Does it mean that we think, it, this, is, this is another way to shed light on what we think, on how far we think the NLRB has come over the last several years in turning its back on the ability of workers to exercise their associational rights under the act, free from intimidation and harassment by employers. The statute does not give employers the right to terminate people who exercise their rights of freedom of association to harass and discriminate against them, for example. That's what, in our view, the decisions of the board, and I'm not, I'm not solely talking about the decisions that were issued in, right. in September, but over the last few years, that's, that's what the corpus of decisions I shows see. us. I, I, I'm almost afraid to do this, but I'm going to interrupt at this point for a moment. If the board's decisions are contrary to law, as you say, why are we not the proper place to be expressing that view rather than an international body? My court sits, I spent most of yesterday reviewing decisions of the NLRB. Uh, usually, it's management who comes and says we've been mistreated. Usually, we say, no, you haven't. 
but uh, why are you talking to some international body instead of me? What have I done? There are, there are, <laughs> I don't mean to exclude you from, the, from our, our wrath. You have a question um, for us, John? There are, there are many avenues, right? And, and domestic and appeal <coughs> is one of them. I think and there's nothing wrong with the AFL-CIO complaining to the ILO. It simply I, But I am, I am troubled by your saying that what the Freedom of Association Committee says is a commitment of the United States. Th that's what troubles me. But, I mean, employers go to whatever form is congenial to them. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think it's a threat to sovereignty. Do you, John? No, I was just exerting my English ancestry and thinking what was gentlemanly. No, so anyway, next <laughs> question. Uh, uh, for the management side. Well, this is it. Then it's somebody else's turn after this one. Go the, ahead. Yes, the, on the Go management ahead. side issues, uh, what do you think is the role of, and, and does it really accomplish anything, this, this corporate social responsibility sort of cliche today? I, I Does the cliche accomplish anything? You sort of answered the question. Well, it, it, it depends. I mean, it, it depends entirely on, on, on the, the company and what they're trying to do with it. it. It's a term that encompasses a whole range of things. Um, the most practical area as it relates to, the, to our discussion, for me, it's, is the supply chain responsibility program. I think it's important. I think the companies, you take Coca-Cola, for example, whom we know. I mean, I think it's a great company, but I don't think they did a very good job of policing the relations they had with bottlers in Colombia. And it has been, I'm making a practical materialist argument, it has been an enormous headache for the brand worldwide. And I think uh, the company recognizes that now. So if, if that's what you mean by corporate social responsibility, that's important. Now, if a company is doing well in, in, and has done well in a, in a town like Rochester, I don't see why they can't uh, make a contribution to the welfare of Rochester. So that's another aspect of corporate the, social responsibility. But the, pe the piece that it links to here is that um, obviously what's, what's changed is that they're being held much more concretely to the actions of their, of their related um, partners and suppliers. And if people, there are, two, there are two terms that are related but different. One is supply chain and one is sphere of influence. And a company's supply chain exceeds beyond its sphere of influence. You can, you can directly control yourself, you can somewhat control joint ventures, and et cetera, but outwards, at some point, it's beyond your control. And this is where the, the it links back to the trade discussion, the effective enforcement of national law is key because it, the, the supply chain management programs that a lot of companies have invested heavily in, in apparel, toys, electronics, it, in an ever-growing number of sectors, is a short-term fix at best. It's a, it's a Band-Aid, and you can pour in millions of dollars. Walmart conducted 17,500 plus audits of factories last year. And you can say anything you want, but that, it's, it's an unsustainable level of activity that will still never ensure the complete uh, perfect gap yesterday announced that, it, that it had, there were some child labor um, so you're saying it's government. necessary but not sufficient. It is. It's a, yeah. it's a Band-Aid, Band and you have to have government involvement. Well, and that's, that's, the piece, that's the piece that has not been happening yet. And it's, it's our hope that the ILO can broker some discussions where you actually get the national government involved in beginning to actually implement and enforce its own laws on, across the board, not just for those factories that export that already tend to be better, and apply it to the domestic enterprises for domestic production that tend to be generally worse. Most off. production in China is not directly by the U.S. companies, but by suppliers <coughs> that you've never heard of before, and they're owned by all sorts of people. And I'm not sure why Walmart should be able to compete with U.S. Uh, counterparts or any other company if they're using suppliers that are violating some basic standards. And not what the Freedom Association Committee says, but basic standards if it's you know, uh, compelled labor, if it's uh, child labor violates the local laws, if it's discrimination against women. And I think most companies would agree with that. I think, Adam, I, I would agree with Adam about corporate social responsibility. I know it's the, the darling of, of um, a number of, of labor movements outside of the United States. Um, I, I would say that enforcement of domestic law is, is itself n not even enough where domestic law falls short of certain minimal standards. But it, it is a Band-Aid. I would, I would agree with that. Next. 
This question is uh, for Professor Eschbecker. Um, when you were uh, proposing that we implement the European uh, system, what we see in two, it's kind of a two-part question. Implement which system? I'm sorry. Uh, the European system. Right. Um, are, 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 on the I first hand, one, are you suggesting that we repeal the Seventh Amendment? And on the second hand, uh, um, do you think that we'd see an influx of uh, privately funded plaintiffs litigation in the event that you were going to see uh, plaintiffs being forced to pay for defense funds in the event that they lose uh, their litigation? I'm not sure I heard the, la the last oh, part. Th that we're going to see an influx in uh, privately funded plaintiffs litigation, I mean, from interest groups. Uh, in in Europe? Yes. No, no, not in Europe. Were we to, uh, invoke, uh, were we to invoke a system where plaintiffs were, plaintiffs were forced to pay for uh, unsuccessful costs of defense? Yeah, I, I wasn't advocating that, but I think we have a system here, a litigation system in the United States, which I've called another writing system that provides uh, Cadillacs for the few and rickshaws for the many. Uh, we have this system that is just a crazy system. The world doesn't understand it. I think we can borrow something from them. Uh, does it involve repeal of the Seventh Amendment? As I understand it, if we create an adjudicative mechanism outside of the civil courts, uh, it's not uh, subject to the Seventh Amendment. Yeah, uh, that could be subject to a long lecture, but the Seventh Amendment does not provide jury trials for A, equi cases in equity as opposed to law, or B, for relief that was not subject to jury trial at the time of the adoption of the Seventh Amendment. Thank you, thank you, Judge Sentel. Yes, we have a ruling, even an advance ruling on that point. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. Another short person here. Um, my question is for Ms. Uh, Greenfield. Uh, my name is Ray Lajeunesse. I'm the legal director for the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Um, the United States Supreme Court has held in several cases that the freedom of association includes the right not to associate. It's also held in a case called Smith versus Arkansas State Employees Association that the freedom of association under the First Amendment does not include the right of uh, government employees, state, state and local government employees, to collectively bargain. The ILO Committee on the Freedom of Association has held to the contrary in a case involving North Carolina. Is it your contention that the United States Supreme Court is in violation of freedom of association under international labor law? I mean, in a, in a word, I would, yes, the Supreme Court's decision is not in conformity with international standards of freedom of association, just like the decision in Hoffman Plastic was not in conformity with the decision with uh, with the um, with stand with international standards of freedom of association. Does that mean it's it's not the law of the land? No, it simply means that there is an objective tripartite view that what are that that certain decisions that certain aspects of our statutes are not in conformity with international labor standards. That's important for a lot of reasons, but it doesn't, and, and I don't think that it's inflammatory or anything other than matter of fact to say the two are in conflict. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't mean that we're somehow, that the law of the land here is not still the law of the land, but it does give us another tool when we argue that certain aspects of our law and practice, certain aspects of our judicial decisions are outliers. In Hoffman Plastics, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, the Supreme Court held that it was not necessary for our businesses to have to go back and pay people who had neither worked nor were legally eligible to work. I'm not sure exactly what was wrong with that, nor was I displeased when the Supreme Court adopted my dissent from the lower court and made it the law of land. That was the holding of Hoffman Plastics. Now, what international treaty that's in violation of was beyond me then. It was not, not even argued then. It was not argued in those It was terms. held to be in violation of the ILO Declaration. Pardon? No. It was held to be in violation of the ILO Declaration. No, it's a, viol it's a violation of uh, freedom of association principles. That's what the Committee on Freedom of Do Association. Do these principles stand? I mean, I cannot believe that we're talking that freedom of association principles just stand there in ether, independent of the institutions around them. Let me say the that I would not recognize Huffman Plastics from Deborah's description of it. Uh, this is quite a digression, but what happened there was the employer fired workers for admittedly wrongful me reasons. 
organizational reasons. They violated their rights of association. This was established. Everybody agrees that's the law of the case. Some of those workers, however, were illegal aliens who were not eligible to be working in the first place. Now, they were paid up to the day they were fired. We're talking about time they did not work. Now, these people were not legally eligible to work for the company. If they had paid them for working, they'd be in violation of the law. The NLRB ordered the company to pay people for not working whom they could not legally have paid for working. They employed to work. Uh, somehow or other, they convinced the majority of my court, en banc, that the NLRB was correct. The Supreme Court said, no, they're not. And to say that this somehow violated the right of association to say that you don't have to pay people for not working who could not legally have worked for you is uh, doesn't fit any definition of the freedom of association I've ever seen. And it was not argued in terms of the right of association. That was a given. The fact that the company had violated rights is where we started from. Everybody agreed to that. It's only in terms of remedy. And that, that's all it's about. The Committee on Freedom of Association, I guess to, to address Sam's point, the Committee on Freedom of Association does articulate principles that, have, that, that underlie freedom of association. If we don't give those credence, then there is no point, then there is no meaning to anything the ILO does. Having said that, what the ILO Committee on Freedom of Association has said is that the right to exercise um, your organizational rights is meaningless unless there are effective remedies. And for that committee, it simply was not enough that the immigration laws in this country trumped the NLRA. For the Committee on Freedom of Association, effective remedies are necessary and in their view, it doesn't matter whether you're undocumented or not. That was their ruling. If I can just say a word, I actually read that report because I've just come out with a book, if I can give it a plug, uh, called Global Issues in the Labor Law. They actually left open what impact the f their not being lawfully in the United States would have. Now, you tell me what that ruling means. Now, I do not understand the United States being represented as a juridical body. Now, if, if that is true, and I think that we've made a mistake going into the ILO, but I don't think the United States is represented as a juridical body on the Freedom of Association Committee, and they've delegated uh, the sort of uh, law application function to the Freedom of Association Committee. Am I wrong about that, Deborah? I don't think that we've delegated a juridical function right. to the Committee on Freedom of Association. There are no particular countries represented on the committee. There are individuals on the committee and there is um, global representation, that is, they're not all from uh, the Northern Hemisphere right. or the Southern Hemisphere. So you have a lot of Americans on it. I was at a, no, you do not have a lot of Americans I was at a Mexico it. NAFTA conference with one of the academic experts. It was embarrassing. All of my academic colleagues are there in front of the Mexican audience condemning U.S. labor law. And all the Mexican labor specialists, to the extent I could understand them, were extolling Mexican labor. And it's just, I mean, the fact that you might get a U.S. academic to sit on the committee, it's not that hard to do. I mean, and to attach such significance to a declaration of the committee seems, seems troubling to me. First, well, first of all, we're not talking about the declaration. We're talking about the Constitution of the ILO and the Declaration of Philadelphia, which are the governing instruments of the ILO. If membership in the ILO is to mean anything, it has to mean that member states are obliged to respect, promote, and realize, or whatever words you want to use, the principles that are underlying the conventions. And how do we know what those principles are? We have a body that the world has created that articulates what those principles mean. I don't see that that's an affront to American sovereignty. It doesn't trump American sovereignty, but it does act as an objective comparator between what the world community says are the basic principles of freedom of association and what a member state does in its own law. We're going practice. to give Adam one bite at this the, one and then we'll go to the next question. The trouble we have with the way the committee works is that in, is, and our main focus again is, is projecting a culture of compliance for many countries that don't have one. And the ILO itself uh, tries to hold countries accountable to conventions they haven't ratified. And it just, it, it's sending, for us, it's just sending the wrong signal. They're, they're looking at violations of conventions that haven't been ratified and, and, and publicly so. And, and it completely runs counter to the message that you should do what you say you're going to do. Here are there are countries that have ratified them and done nothing. And they're, you know, report after report for 40 years saying this country has taken no action to implement 
the, the convention it ratified. And on the other hand, uh, the U.S. gets hauled in for, for violations of conventions it hasn't ratified, even though we do have systems in place that differ in different technical ways, but, but essentially uh, support freedom of association. Next yeah, question. I don't think those Next are question. William Mastani, Kirkland and Ellis. In general, will this debate in the end not deteriorate into a line drawing exercise? Because once a what exercise? Line drawing. A line drawing exercise. Okay. Because once you go down the road of essentially trying to export American employment and labor law, um, you run into the question of where you stop. I mean, there are some universally held uh, positions, or almost universally held positions in the United States, such as forced labor and child labor. But at what point do you decide enough is enough and that it's not appropriate to apply U.S. anti-discrimination law in its full form or protections under the Fair Labor Standards Act I mean, even in Hoffman, if I remember the argument correctly, you know, Justice Scalia and the uh, justices in the majority, you know, took the position that it's not like we are not going to force employers to pay the individuals who have actually worked because, uh, or, and I think a kind of middle ground would be with respect to, say, overtime compensation. That would kind of lie between substantive protection of individuals to be paid under their contracts and the, and the issue that was uh, the law, the protection that was the issue in that case. So what principles do you use to draw the line as to how far you go in trying to impose American labor and employment standards on the rest of the world? I guess the part of the question I don't understand is where the imposition of American labor and employment standards comes from. It's not what the ILO is trying to do. Mm -hmm. It's not what our free trade agreements do. We're not saying that Peru, China, we're not saying in, in any of these instances whether we have a free trade agreement or not that the goal is imposition or that the commitment is imposition of American labor standards. The free trade agreements talk about uh, the commitments under the declaration and, and as, as you can see there's a, there's, a, there's a real debate about what those commitments are. So I, don't, I, don't, I guess I don't get the premise of the question. Anyone else want to take a shot at that? Or? No, I mean, the only thing we're trying to push for that, that comes from the U.S. Uh, system is, is the focus on compliance, implementation and compliance, but it's with the national labor law. So it's, it's where the, in, our, in our system, the law is the law, and it, it hopefully gets implemented and enforced. And in many other countries, the law is there, and it's fine, and Chinese have, have, China has better overtime law than we do. Um, just, you know, it's, it's much harder to actually uh, catch, get your pay than it is here. Next. Uh, yes, uh, I guess this question is for Ms. Uh, Greenfield and uh, Professor Eschweiger. Uh, the tremendous body of uh, literature, theoretical and empirical, suggests that trade it does improve the income of people in countries around the world. My question is, is really of ignorance. Is there a, a, a similar body of theory and literature that show that uh, labor unions improve either income or even meet a Rawlsian mini-max, uh, maxi-min standard of improving the income of the least advantaged and in general, let alone that specific institutions, specific doctrines of the kind we've been talking about improve economic growth or that kind of distribution. If there's not, and I'm suspicious at least that there isn't any kind of fine-grained analysis of the latter kind, it's in a great mistake to have a centralized body uh, offering uniform standards around the world rather than to have uh, experiment in a variety of institutions uh, in the labor area as in others. There is a growing body of literature. I would say it's in its nascent form. Um, there's a study that the ILO and the WTO did uh, in March of 2007 um, which reviews the literature on this which shows that um, developing democratic trade unions actually strengthens uh, the ability of, of, of the working class uh, in, in a particular country to survive. It encourages uh, foreign direct investment. There is a study by the OECD. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head, but there is a growing body of literature that um, certainly disputes, uh, refutes the contention that um, it's that this is that the developing strong democratic trade unions around the world will hurt investment and trade, but it also is is now showing that it actually 
uh, strengthens the global trading regime. So the, I think the end. I the realize answer, yeah. the danger of anecdotal evidence, but I think the working conditions in the union mills and American comparison have been significantly better than in non-union mills. I'm not talking about today, but in the days before. The bad old days and the labor unions are still trying to get their toehold. Those mills that were unionized had better working conditions than those that were not. I don't think, there's a, demo- I don't think the there's a democratic country in the world, I could be wrong about this, that does not have a strong independent trade union movement. And until there is one in China, I don't think there's any guarantee we're going to have a, uh, we're going to evolve towards a democratic society there that in some broad sense shares the gains from trade. Uh, we've learned uh, bitterly, I think, in this country, uh, uh, we had unregulated labor markets that didn't work out. So, I mean, uh, I'm glad you asked a question because it reminds me of my liberal roots. I mean, I think we can have support for an independent labor movement, uh, deal with the excesses where they occur, uh, and insist that that's an important part of how we think workers should compete in this country. And then I think it's an important part of what uh, uh, we should expect our trading partners to do. I, th- I mean, um, from our side, the, the key issue is, is labor market flexibility and the, and the balance between job security and labor market flexibility and the, and the, the, the break on growth is, is excessive job security at the expense of labor market flexibility and job growth. But that's not, a, that's not an inevitable accompaniment of a labor union. No, no, that's what no, I'm saying. That, it's not. That's usually I'm, accomplished by legislation in these countries. Yeah, no, no, it's not a function of, of whether there's a union, uh, large union movement or not. It's just simply the rules on, on uh, labor market flexibility. There are some very interesting studies coming out of the Cambodian apparel industry um, that showed that the development of, no matter how many unions there were, and there, and, and, and there certainly was no one apparel in, uh, union, but the development of um, even factory by factory, strong uh, grassroots led, shop floor led um, unions really contributed to the rise in, in living if standards. If I could just say one more thing about that linkage, it seems to me you could be against a worldwide body imposing uniform standards and, and be more affirmative on the case for unionism yeah. in, in domestic countries. I don't see the necessary connection there. I think they're definitely independent variables. You can have a strong domestic labor union movement, trade union movement in this or any other country without any international organization. And yeah. Um, well, the discussion of, of uh, the liberty of people to negotiate for peaceful, uh, lawful purposes is interesting. And of course, it, there's been international, international movements along those lines for many uh, years. Um, I was curious about something that Ms. Greenfield brought up. You t- spoke of a standard, international standard of a, a dollar going towards a dollar a day uh, as sort of a, a base wage. And, and my question is this. Um, well, I'm, t- I'm somewhat curious where that comes from, like what the source of that is. And along the same lines, um, you know, even 40 years ago in the 1960s, uh, you know, the Grateful Dead would sing uh, – you know, make make good money five dollars a day. Uh, you know, make me more might move away. It seems like that a dollar a day would be a decline in standards. Well, it depends on it depends on where you're looking. The dollar a day comes from uh, the United Nations. Um, at the turn of the 21st century, the United Nations established Millennium Development Goals, and one of the and, and I, I can't remember how many of the goals, but one of the goals is that by I think 2015. Um, a certain percentage of the world will be at or above the, the global poverty level, which is a dollar a day. So that's what that comes from. Just, just quickly on that, um, before, before the next question, I think the, the, the goals are great. Um, trouble is there's been nothing really to articulate how you get there or, uh, or what, what they're asking countries to do to get there. Um, and we've been looking more at it's not a program at the World Bank that is looking at domestic reforms that will promote growth, and they growth that will help raise the economy and, and income for people will also help raise uh, tax revenue for governments that, in many cases, get a tiny amount of the tax revenue they, they, they should get, in which case they can't fund things like labor inspectors and environmental inspectors and everything else that goes with it, fund the court systems properly so there isn't rampant corruption. I mean, at some level, we're, the goals are fine, but in our view, 
actual national reforms are much more critical because they, they if, you know, if, they, if they can get a handle on the domestic economy, get it growing, get funds into the government, into private hands, and clean up the systems, then, then you can actually talk about effective implementation and not have to realize that you know, it's a great goal, but because the, the court system is absolutely corrupt or dominated by a political party, there's no hope of a fair outcome in any kind of labor dispute. So the, the rights are great at the top, but you need the systems and institutions in place domestically, in our view. The key to get there is, is the national reforms that these global goals uh, are, are fine, but they don't, they don't affect the change nationally that get you there. Yes, sir. Uh, you actually stole my fire. Uh, I hopped up to, to follow up on, on James' question uh, regarding you know, research that would, would indicate that, uh, uh, that the, the, uh, this kind of freedom association concept as related to unionism had created uh, a more positive economic environment. And, and I would certainly agree, it's not mutually exclusive to say that, that not only anecdotally, but statistically and demographically, it, that is so in countries with strong union movements, but it's certainly not mutually exclusive that that could uh, take place outside the, the countenance of international standards. Uh, to slightly then recast the question, um, it seems to me that the importance of vigorous labor movements uh, has, or, or has, has somewhat diminished as a consequence of the place of government or government regulation in setting labor standards. That, uh, that, the, that the labor unions have almost become an intermediary between workers and the government as much as they are an intermediary uh, between uh, workers and their employer. And, and I'm wondering, and I'm not familiar with the ILO standards uh, per se, but I, I, I wonder if, uh, if this style of, uh, of uh, worker uh, union government uh, relationship is uh, is perhaps in, in your in well perhaps Deborah or in other minds uh, a counterproductive uh, model uh, from these uh, what were demonstrably successful or necessary associations that gained not only uh, that that gained directly from employers through that freedom of association better working conditions, higher wages, and so forth. Well, it would, it, it would be ironic, I suppose, to say that we don't need unions anymore because now we have gov government will control, government will provide, um, everyone's rights are secure. I think we in the union movement see that that's absolutely not the case. It's not the case here. It's not the case anywhere, uh, anywhere else in the world. I mean, what unions do is to force change, whether it's a distributive model, distributive justice model or any other, they force change, they force change partly among employers, partly in the government, but um, they also continue to improve the working conditions, the wages, uh, the rights of those they represent, and they are, I think, constantly um, at in a kind of in attention with the government in terms of what more should be provided, not just for those they represent, but for everyone else. So I think optimally you might get to the point where you have minimal standards like the Fair Labor Standards Act, like the Occupational Safety and Health Act, but there's so much more work to be done. I can't imagine that that would happen without collective action on the part of workers. If I could speak to that, even though I, I think you didn't address it to me. I think there is a relationship between the health of unions in private sector and the growth of laws across the world. And I, I understand what Deborah's saying. She's right. You need some basic laws. But uh, if the more you rely on the legal system and the litigation model uh, to deliver uh, justice, to uh, uh, occupy the labor cost, the regulatory component of labor cost, the less room there is for unionism. And I, you know, you can find this throughout the Latin American countries. Now, maybe the union movement is a political force; it keeps it in place, but it's not there as a private economic institution, which is what I think you know Gompers and those folks had in mind. Uh, they didn't trust reliance on the state, and it, it's kind of ironic. There's now more reliance on the state. It's not so much about the U.S. movement, but worldwide, I believe the reliance on the state, in lieu of collective bargaining, is the pattern, is the trend. 
We'll take a second shot, okay? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, court has held that uh, the Freedom of Association includes the right not to associate. I'm curious as to whether the ILO Committee on Freedom of Association also recognizes that the right uh, to join unions also includes the right not to join unions as protected by Freedom of Association. I'm sure they do. It yeah, it does. They, it does. Yeah, it does. It's right. The, the I can't. I can't uh, think of it. It does. The European read, Union does. Yeah. But what does it matter if there's going to be an extension law that imposes the collective bargaining contract across the non-union sector? The, the 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 differences between the U.S. system and the and the Convention on the Freedom of Association of the ILO relate to things. Not. I mean, it does recognize that, but it, it, a key distinction is that in the U.S. the rights are individual rights, and in the, the ILO Convention is written more as a collective right, an organizational right, an institutional right. So it's that, I mean, in, in the, 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 the organizational right is derivative of the collective, of, of the individual rights in the U.S. The issues sort of that concern around. your organization are not likely to be salient because union security is not, you know, a compulsory payment of dues is not the law in most of these countries. Anybody else? Not then, if anything else, the panelists would like to say to each other that, you know, in public. I, I, I think Deborah has been a wonderfully effective and gallant person for coming to this conference. <laughs>